All right, let's pray together. I'm so glad that you're watching this, and uh, I want us to pray together because I have an important message to give to you. And uh, based on the subject that I'm going to give you, I know the devil does not want you to hear what I'm about to tell you. So let's pray. Let's ask God's protection over this message, this word, that the devil would not steal it, but it would be sealed to your heart so that you may be able to be equipped to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and be protected as you follow him. So let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for this moment. Thank you for these godly people who are watching me. I pray, God, that you would speak to us. I pray right now for a hedge of protection to be over us as we listen to this, no matter where we are. And so I pray, God, that we would have spiritual ears to hear what you are saying to us. It's very clear. And that, God, you would give us the proper mindset to understand these things. So speak today. Speak to our hearts. Speak to our lives. And, God, uh, take us to a new level with you as we understand the spiritual truths that you want to unlock to us. So, God, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so far in this series on the devil, because of sin, we know that the devil possesses great power, uh, and he uses this power against the people of God. He harasses, he tempts, he tries, he lies, he counterfeits the truth, he pursues, he steals, he kills, and he destroys. And I told you last week to live spiritually as if a lion or a serial killer is on the loose. And the Bible makes it very clear that we are to be prepared for battle, spiritually sober, protected for attacks against the enemy. But here's what I want to tell you this week. Listen very carefully. This does not mean that we as Christ followers are powerless. It does not mean that you and I should be living in fear. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us the complete opposite of that. We are never to live in fear. As a matter of fact, we possess even greater power than the devil because of the one that is living in fear us. It is not our power, but it is the power of the risen Christ, the living God living within us. His name is Jesus, and that's who we are seated with at this moment. Okay, let's talk about the power of Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus surrendered his power when he came to earth and fashioned himself as a man. Look at Philippians 2, 5 through 11. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So he laid total power aside. Well, what changed? The resurrection changed. Jesus Christ died on the cross, victorious over sin and the grave, and he rose from the dead in total power and authority. And because of that, Jesus Christ holds supreme power over every living thing in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Revelation 1, 18. 
I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. Uh, the devil right now is defeated because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is subject to one person, J-E-S-U-S. -S, and you know that to be true. Okay, let me give you some scriptures that nails this down. 1 John 3, 8. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work, to destroy it, and he has. Colossians 2, 15. And having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by his cross. Hebrews 2.14, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. He didn't have it any longer. Jesus broke the power of the devil. 1 John 4.4 4. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them for he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Think about the Great Commission. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. Jesus has supreme authority. And I love how the Apostle Paul describes the totality of Christ's rule and his power and authority in Ephesians 1. Let's read verses 19 through 23. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. We have this power. Now he, Jesus, is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else. Not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. Yes, the devil may have power, but he has no authority over Jesus Christ, the sinless spotless lamb of God, the risen and exalted one. He is subject to him always and forevermore. And one day, the Bible makes it clear that Jesus is going to wipe away and finish off the devil for good. Aren't you glad for that? Listen to Second Th 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the Lord Jesus Christ will will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. By the breath of his mouth, he's going to do away with the devil. Follow my line of thinking and the Bible's line of thinking. If Satan is subject to Jesus, he then is also subject to the followers of Jesus. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And notice what he says in the next verse. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. You would expect Peter to write, uh, be sober, on alert, 
the devil's walking around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Therefore, lock yourselves away. Hide the women and children. Be fearful. Be afraid. But he doesn't say that at all. He says, resist. Resist. And the book of James sheds a little more light on this. James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Did you catch that? He has to flee when you resist. Okay, hold on. The operative word here is not resist. The operative word in this verse is submit. Submission. Let me just tell you, you might want to write this down. Unless there is submission, there cannot be resistance. Unless there is submission, there cannot be resistance. Remember, it is Jesus Christ that has all power, all rule, and all authority. And as long as we are submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ, we possess that same power and that same authority. But listen, the devil has authority only where sin is allowed to exist. So, if we are harboring sin, if we're not yielded to God, then the devil has permission to harass us and we have no power over him. This is why Paul writes in Ephesians 4, do not give the devil a foothold. And that's exactly what sin does. Sin gives the devil a foothold. This is why submission is the operative word. There is no resistance until you first have submission. Okay, how do you do that? How do you do that? How do you resist the devil? Okay, Ephesians chapter 6, 11 through 18. We're just going to go through this systematically verse by verse. He writes, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. It is not our power. It is the power that belongs to Jesus Christ. And he says, be strong in that power that is available to you. Verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Uh, because we are with Christ, we can stand against the enemy. We are never called to flee from the enemy. We are called to flee from sin. We are never called to flee, be fleeing from the enemy. We are repeatedly called to stand against the defeated enemy. Verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. So often we begin thinking that we are battling and wrestling against earthly foes, human to human. And because of that, we stop there and we, we don't get past that. But we don't realize there is a greater enemy at work. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. And this happens all the time. And I want to tell you how the devil works. The devil primarily works through our thoughts. So if he can put a thought in your mind that is against God, that is not from God, he can get you believing a lie that is contrary to the truth of God. And what happens? That lie begins to be lodged in your heart and you begin to believe a lie of the devil. Here's another thing that happens. When a thought is put into your mind that is from the devil, instead of processing that thought, that word is spoken. And what happens is it is spoken and it is like an arrow that penetrates another person's heart. And what happens when that arrow receives that heart and that arrow is believed? Well, the Bible makes it clear. He is out to steal, to kill, 
and to destroy. They wound. They wound. And what's the reaction normally? Why did you say this to me? How could you be so mean when you said this to me? Well, you know it's true. I'm just telling you what's true. And we begin fighting amongst flesh and blood when in reality that arrow came from the devil. According to this passage, what should our reaction be? What you said is not from God. Therefore, in Jesus' name, I do not receive it. And you should not speak the devil's words. You should be able to understand what you were saying, giving precedence to the Holy Spirit and only speaking what he gives you to say. Could you imagine if that went on in a husband and wife conversation? Could you imagine if we said, um, darling, we're not talking about this. This is from the devil. I do not receive it in Jesus' name. We don't do that because we don't believe that. No, we begin arguing as husband and wife and the devil's just sitting back there laughing. He made the bomb explode. We'd received it and now there's repercussions for this and falling out body parts all over the place because there's shrapnel and carnage because the devil has done his work. Listen, we are not fighting against flesh and blood. We are fighting against rulers and powers and authorities in the unseen world. And you need to get your mind wrapped around that. I love this quote. The battle may be within man, but it is never between men. It's never between men. And after Paul tells us who our real enemy is, he tells us how to stand, how to stand. Look at verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. He says stand. He says you're to stand your ground. And when you're standing your ground after the battle is done, you're still standing. Okay, how do you do that? He says put on the whole armor of God. Verse 14, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. They're real. Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit at all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always be keeping on praying for all of the Lord's people. Paul, when he's writing this in Rome, he is probably chained to a Roman guard. And if not, he, he knows that they're nearby. He's held at the garrison or the fortress. There in Rome, hundreds, thousands of Roman soldiers are around. And he's writing this in the Roman provinces. And so, People are always going to understand and know exactly what he's talking about because they see Roman guards every day. So Paul's looking at a Roman soldier and he's saying, look, he's protected here, he's protected here, he's wearing this, he's wearing this, wearing this. So he's making an analogy to our spiritual warfare. Okay, We as believers don't put on literal armor. Rather, here's what we do. We arm ourselves with a spiritual mindset and a spiritual maturity and identity that we are always to understand and appropriate. Briefly, I want you to notice the words that Paul uses for this armor. He says the word truth. If the devil is a liar, then we need to know the truth so that when the devil counterfeits, with a lie, we say, no, in Jesus' name, that is not the truth, and we don't receive that. What is the truth? The truth is found in the Word of God, that we're loved by God. There's nothing that we can do to get out of God's love, that we are with Christ, seated with Christ in the heavenlies, with all principalities and powers under our feet. The Bible calls us a royal priesthood, sons and daughters of the living God. We are alive with Christ. Uh, we are more than conquerors through Him 
who loved us and we could go on and on. And I want to tell you, boldly proclaim this out loud to yourself and to the devil. The devil cannot read your thoughts. So proudly tell him that you believe the truth. Okay, here's another one. It's the word righteousness. We are the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Right now, we as believers stand completely righteous before God the Father. He sees us because of Jesus. He sees us as being completely righteous. This is why Paul writes and he says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because we are in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We have no fault right now before the Father. So that when the devil tries to accuse us, we say not guilty, not guilty because we're completely righteous. Amen. I'm going to give you another one. It's the word peace, peace. The wall of enmity between God and man, between us and God as Christ followers, has been destroyed. It's been torn down. We have peace with God right now through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are no longer considered to be an enemy of God. We are friends of God. We are ha having peace with God. So in other words, God's not mad at us. He's not. And, and the devil wants you to believe that, but you need to arm yourself with understanding Peace. We have peace with God. And then he says faith. Faith that extinguishes the fiery arrows of the evil one. It is faith not in ourselves. It is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who conquered death and sin and the grave forever and ever. And then he says the word salvation. The helmet of salvation. In other words, we are securely saved, forever saved, forever forgiven. There's nothing that can be added to that or taken away from that. And our eternal home is in heaven. It is waiting for us right now. We're saved. We're saved. And uh, you can't lose that. You can't take that away, right? So this is what we tell the devil. I'm saved and there's nothing that you can do about it. Amen. All right. And then the Bible gives us three Offensive weapons. I thought there was only one, Pastor Matt. No, there's three, actually, in this passage. You know the first one, the Word of God, and he calls it the sword of the Spirit. Uh, what does the Word tell us? The Word tells us everything that I just told you. Every fact that I just talked about, that our spiritual identity is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why we are to always be in the Word so that we can appropriate and have a renewed mind at all times. A renewed mind. And the Word of God does that. It takes off the filth that we've been receiving in the world and it transforms us by the renewing of our mind so that we believe the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and we can use those as we battle against the devil. Okay, there's a second weapon that he gives to us, and that is the weapon of prayer. He says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions, be alert, and always keep on praying. So the Word of God is not your only weapon. Prayer is also your weapon, and I believe it is the great unused weapon in the church today that we need to begin using and appropriating. Let me tell you this. Look, look at me very carefully. The devil is afraid of our prayers. He is. Sidlow Baxter famously said this, Surely the devil must say to his demons, Boys, keep them from prayer. Because if we can keep them from praying, we can beat them every time. But if they pray, they'll beat us every time. I love how Adrian Rogers, who's gone to be with the Lord, my former pastor, he talks about praying and he calls prayer the guided missile, the guided missile. And I want to tell you from his own words, here's what he says. Let me tell you what the Christian's secret weapon is. It's prayer. Prayer is like an intercontinental ballistic missile. And let me tell you why it's so great. Dear friend, you can launch this missile firing from any spot at any time, day or night. Second, it travels silently, undetected. Third, it travels swiftly at the speed of thought. Fourth, 
It hits the target every time. Fifth, it can be fired with delayed detonation. When the missile lands, it can explode 50 years later, 100 years later. 2,000 years ago, Jesus prayed for me that great high priestly prayer in John 17, 6 through 24. Jesus prayed for those who would believe on him through the words of the apostles. And his prayer is being answered today. That missile is exploding in my heart tonight. You may be praying for a loved one, but don't see an answer yet. Do not give up. Sometimes there is delayed detonation. Last of all, the devil has no defense against it. There is no anti-prayer missile. The devil can't shoot it down. This kind of prayer is unstoppable. The devil can't stop me from praying. He cannot keep my prayers from being heard, and he cannot keep God from answering. Don't you love that? Isn't that wonderful? And this is why he fears and he trembles when a man or woman begins praying. Because here's what I want to tell you. Praying mobilizes God to action. When you pray for God to move, he moves. When you pray for God to act, he acts. And when you pray for God to do something, he does. Prayer mobilizes God to action. And I want to tell you, the devil does not want you to know that. He wants you to think, well, why pray? I don't need to pray. And what does prayer really do? Does God really hear my prayers? Listen, praying motivates and moves God to action. So pray like it. That's why he says pray in all occasions for everything, for people everywhere. All right, there's a third weapon that I want to tell you about. And it's hidden, but it's there. And it's God's people. Do you know that God's people gathered together is a weapon against the enemy? He says, be alert and keep on praying for God's people. Community kills the devil. Kills the devil. Let me give you a verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 through 5. Paul writes and he says, I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you something that even the pagans don't do. I am told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. You are so proud of yourselves, but you should be mourning in sorrow and shame, and you should remove this man from your fellowship. Even though I am not with you in person, I am with you in the spirit, and as though I were there, I have already passed judgment on this man in the name of the Lord Jesus you must call a meeting of the church. I will be present with you in spirit, and so will the power of the Lord Jesus. Then you must throw this man out and hand him over to Satan so that his sinful nature will not be destroyed and he himself will be saved on the day of the Lord's return. Okay, removal from fellowship means to be handed over to Satan. Think about that. That's how important fellowship among believers is. To not be in fellowship with them is to be standing on the side of Satan. But fellowship keeps, uh, keeps the devil away. And I want to tell you, the weapons that he gives us, the word of God gives us the principles and the truth to stand on. Praying gives us the power to see the word at work. And fellowship gives you the protection and the strength you need as we stand together. And you need all three of these weapons in order to defeat the devil on a consistent basis. So, if you want to experience defeat, all you have to do is forget who you are in Christ, neglect the Word of God, don't pray, and stay away from your brothers and sisters in Christ. And every time you do this, the devil will defeat you every single time. So I'm going to tell you, don't do that. What you need to do is appropriate the weapons and the armor that God has given you. He says, don't flee the devil. He says, resist the devil, submit to the Lord, and he must flee from you. My friend, brothers and sisters, never forget that. It is a spiritual truth that you desperately need. Would you pray with me, Lord Jesus Christ? 
I thank you for this moment. Thank you for every person listening to the sound of my voice. So God, I pray, I pray, Lord, I pray that you would wedge this message deep down inside. Help us to memorize these scriptures. Help us to be people of your, of your word, people of prayer, and people connected to the body of Christ, not living in isolation, but standing together with our brothers and sisters as we encourage one another, admonish one another, and keep each other accountable. So God, have your perfect way. I pray that we would no longer give territory and ground to the devil by the lies that we believe and by the arrows that come out of our mouth into other people's hearts. Oh God, I pray that you would keep us from that. In Jesus' precious name, amen, amen. All right, let me give you three questions and you can chew on these. First one, as a result of this message, what is the common arrow that the devil often shoots in your mind? What is it that you begin believing that you should not? Maybe based on this message, you're realizing it for the very first time. So ask yourself these questions, this question, and begin discussing this right now. All right, question number two. What happens to you or the people around you when you believe the devil's lie or you speak his lie? What have you seen happen even in your own heart or what, what havoc have you seen as a result of your words, the devil's lies being uttered through your mouth and going directly into someone's heart? So talk about that and then we'll get to question three. Question three, what would happen if we stopped seeing conflict from a human to human perspective and rather saw it as spiritual warfare on a consistent basis? Let me ask you another question. How can we begin doing that? What can we do in order to begin recognizing the lies of the devil? So you ask yourself these questions. I want to thank you for listening. My friends, my brothers and sisters, stand firm against the devil. God has given you the power. Stand firm against him. In Jesus' name, amen.